thank you so much and uh, uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, final session. Sunil, uh, thanks for coming all the way from Delhi to do this session. It's, uh, uh, you know, uh, the session holds so many possibilities. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, enough about uh, uh, Sunil, he's a career marketer. He's worked across, you know, large FMCG companies all through his career, including Marico, Godrej. Now he runs, uh, uh, as uh, the anchor mentioned, one of India's most iconic uh, fashion brands, Raymond, a brand which has a very rich legacy, but has also uh, kind of continued to be very relevant, uh, very sort of contemporary as years have uh, gone by. Like, uh, you know, old wine, Raymond has kind of aged yeah. well. So, Neil, tell us the secret of that, you know, aging. Okay. So, I think it's a, thank you for having me today here. It's a pleasure being here. And Naval is an old friend as well. So we have interacted a lot over the years. So first of all, you know, uh, I want to just tell you something that uh, since we're talking about our legacy brand, uh, Raymond has just entered into its centenary year as a company, as a brand. So this brand actually got launched in on uh, 10th of September 1925. So we, on from 9th September, we've just started celebrating our 100 years, 100th year. And next year on 10th September, will be 100 years young. So this year marks a very Fantastic. big milestone moment for us. And although we don't know the exact data, we've been debating this and trying to get this data, I think India may not have more than, India would have less than 20 companies which have thrived for 100 years. So I think that's wow. one piece, you know. So that's something which tells you the power of, uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to see how many organizations in India have been there since last 100 years and more, you know. So I think it's our last count of 17, 18. We don't know the exact data, but it's definitely less than 20, I think. And so that's, uh, I think, uh, this thing. Uh, another interesting piece which has happened this year with this thing is that you all know this uh, very large global val brand valuation agency called Brand Finance that's PLC. Right. So this year they have rated uh, Raymond in the top 10 iconic brands of the country. Wow. So that's another big milestone which has happened for us. And I mean, it's coincidental that it's happening in all in the 100th year. So yeah, I think, uh, so I'm, I think, uh, privileged to be, you know, uh, playing a role in taking the journey forward of a brand which has been carved out very beautifully over 100 years by many, many generations of marketeers, promoters, uh, families and a family who have been there at the helm for, you know, pretty long time. So I think I have inherited something which is very, very strong. Uh, one thing which I can tell you is if when I look back, I've been here for now two and a half years and I look back at this brand and why it stayed what it is so relevant across what maybe now seven, eight generations of the country, if you take one generation of 15 years, is uh, three things, you know. One is uh, truly the trust that belongs to Raymond across every consumer class. This is one thing whenever we do any dipstick, one thing which comes out unabashedly is trust. That if the brand is carrying the thappa of Raymond, you can blindly trust the product quality. No, I think that has been the very foundation of this brand. And I can tell you right from the promoters, first innovation on this, I think this runs through the ethos of the organization, that you do whatever it is, will never compromise an inch on the quality of the product. Or that I think is the foundation. Obviously then comes other pillars on top of it, how do you, you know, stay relevant in terms of fashion, innovation, etc. The second piece is this brand has been a very innovative brand over the years. So this brand has been at the hallmark, of, at the, the forefront of doing product innovation in the categories it belongs in. And the third thing which I can tell you is, which is a question which comes to Mr. Gaurav Singhania often and to me very often also in this thing is, a lot of people ask us that why you have not gone beyond men, you know, it comes. I think somewhere this brand has been very clear that this brand unabashedly says, I, I owe it, to, I, I belong to the men of the country, you know. So it's been very focused on saying what I will do and what I will not do. I think maybe these are the three things which come to mind. Fantastic. Obviously, you know, when you talk about trust, today's, you know, new age marketing books talk about, you know, brand promise and, you know, how it is important to build. But here is a, you know, a real life use case study which has been there for decades where, uh, you know, trust has been a bedrock, so to say, of, you know, how the brand has been built. So, Neil, you've been a career marketer and you've spent, uh, you know, a large part of your career in FMCG companies. FMCG sector in many ways is, you know, the kind of breeding ground for uh, CEOs in corporate India. Uh, you know, Sudhir Sitapati, uh, you know, who is now 
uh, the CEO of Godrej wrote a book when he was at HUL, yeah. uh, terming HUL as the CEO factory, right? What is it about, you know, FMCG companies that kind of train you so well to work across so many diverse industries and also really build iconic brands? If you, I don't know, I don't have a study, but I'm sure if uh, somebody were to do one and looked at, you know, top 500 fortune companies in India, uh, a large majority uh, of the CEOs will be from the FMCG sector. Okay, honestly, I have not thought it from that point of view, but if you are asking me to reflect on this, uh, because I, I would like to talk also what I have learnt in by being in a different industry now. Yeah. But I can tell you maybe if what FMCG teaches you, and I have been a career marketer through large stints in America and GCPL, two very large stints of mine, is that maybe uh, FMCG teaches you, uh, I think the, it, okay, so let me put it this way. In FMCG, and this is something which I may say which may not be, you know, understood too many easily is that people think product is the heart of FMCG. I can tell you after coming to fashion, I realized the product is much lower in hierarchy in FMCG. The two things which are the biggest modes in FMCG, which trains you also, uh, is that one of the biggest modes in FMCG is actually brand engagement and building brand power, brand equity. Because if you see what happens, honestly you ask me, there's very little differentiation which consumer feels between one soap to another soap in terms of product experience, right? If you ask me, maybe the last single biggest innovation in soaps, maybe in the last century, would have been Dove, product innovation, right? Which is genuinely a different product. Otherwise, there's very little consumer discernible differentiation in a soap. The same would go for, let's say, if you ask me, maybe uh, in a category, uh, take anything, maybe, uh, uh, DOs also. That's why, you know, cluttered category. Yeah, fragrances change, right? But what is the difference in today? The last big innovation which happened was the hundred sprays, the okay. thousand sprays, right? The fox spray. That really changed the game. But after that, everything, there has been no other very big innovation. So, what in F happens in FMCG? Product innovation happens. Uh, it happens, let's say, once in a few years. And then those innovations stay for some time. So for a large part of the time, your differentiation happens with con in consumer's mind through building a very strong brand loyalty. And that's where marketing starts playing a very big role. And that you learn how to create strong brand consideration or brand loyalty in a category where the product differentiation may not be very, very strong. Second, FMCG is the bedrock is distribution. The go-to-market and the reach matters the most after you build the brand because finally FMCG is about millions and millions of consumers, you know. So the two fundamental pieces that FMCG ends up teaching you is both sales and marketing. Very interesting, right. yes, yes. And then they become the kind of foundation for a general management over a period of time. Because then as you become a general manager, starting on sales, marketing, then you get into understanding, and especially in FMCG marketing, one, one more piece happens. FMG marketing is truly not only marketing. FMG the marketing also is a kind of a quasi PNL responsibility. We are responsible for supply chain, at least interfacing right. supply chain, cost, etc. So it becomes a very good 360 degree kind of a honing which happens in FMCG over a period of time. And that's maybe why, uh, you know, over a period of time you may see, I've not seen this data actually, honestly, yeah. that uh, whether uh, people tend to then migrate to a general management role. These Absolutely. Days. If you're learning and doing so much, then, you know, your learnings would kind of apply to every industry, albeit uh, slightly differently in, for example, cases like yours, where fashion and apparel, you said, you know, product sort of, you know, yeah, importance can, is far more than, say, a soap or a shampoo. So I can tell you one piece which I've unlearned after coming here in this industry is if I were to put the hierarchies in this, and this is the biggest tricky piece which FMCG never teaches you, but which fashion lifestyle you have to unlearn and say, I want to learn this again, is unlike FMCG, which is much simpler in product, because as I said, product innovations don't happen very often. The product remains the same for next few years, five years, right? Uh, supply chains are very simpler because you're doing only few limited SKUs, you'll have 500 SKUs, 1,000 SKUs. Here, the win and the lose happens every season. You could have been a winner in fashion and lifestyle and every season, because this is a, if you ask me, fashion and lifestyle is the most challenging marketing task on hand. Because A, and what I want to say, when you're in fashion lifestyle, 
you are actually dealing in a product which is defining the personality of the consumer. When I do soaps, it doesn't define my personality. It's something which I'm taking bath and it's a very introvertive, very immersive but individual experience. What jacket I'm wearing today when I'm stepping into the stage defines my persona. What color I'm wearing will tell you a lot about me. Even one socks I'm wearing will tell you a lot about me. Right? That's truly marketing because you know what you're dealing with the categories that you're dealing with some a category where you will define consumer personality and nothing can be more and hence the consumer immersion in a fashion lifestyle is very very deep and that becomes a very big challenge because that means the first and foremost battle that has to be won is the product battle and hence products change every six months four months and that is a very complex exercise you can succeed in one season, you could go wrong in another season. Absolutely. This right. is what other industries don't teach you. Soaps and uh, shampoos have to uh, make you feel good, while the jacket you uh, wear has to make you feel good as well as make you look good. Yeah. So it has a sort of… So it's got a wrong. fashion as a, an external perspective, but there's a lot of internal. Of course, it is both. Yeah. Of course, it is both. Let me ask you about, you know, uh, you know, what technology is doing to marketing across yeah. industries and, uh, you know, it's a very vast topic, so I'll try to kind of crunch it down. Uh, there are so many angles of, you know, how marketing is, uh, technology, marketing is getting impacted and changed due to technology. Tell us a bit about, you know, your uh, uh, industry while you explained the importance of product vis-a-vis -vis FMCG industries. Yeah. But, you know, how is technology changing? Fashion apparel is as old an industry as you can imagine, yeah. right? People have been wearing clothes ever since perhaps they started walking. Uh, so, in that sense, it's as old an industry that you can think of, much older than auto and, you know, so many other legacy yeah. businesses. How is the role of technology, you know, impacting marketing in as legacy and as old a business as yeah. yours? So, yeah, so it's a very important piece here actually and um, technology is impacting everybody. But let's say within Raymond Lifestyle, we have multiple businesses and two parts, one, one piece which all of us know Raymond for is the fabrics, you know, where you end up actually getting to a Raymond shop, you tailor it, you get it stitched. Then there is a branded apparel side of businesses where you have brands like Park Avenue, Color Plus and Raymond Ready to Wear. And then the third brand that we have created, which is about the innovation and we're moving into what is now ethnic, we're called Ethnics by Raymond. You may have seen those stores around. So let me talk about the, our core business, which is fabrics. Where one of the biggest pieces what happens is when a consumer walks into the store, is one biggest marketing challenge comes there is that you are, what I say that, uh, tell my team is that you buy fabrics but you never consume fabric. It's a very interesting bridge that Raymond fabric business has to deal with. They are buying fabric but what are finally consuming is a stitched jacket or a stitched trouser. And then there's a bridge in between where you have to tailor. So one marketing challenge comes in there that the consumer while buying fabric has to visualize the end product. Very interesting marketing challenge. When you buy, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, a fragrance, you know this is the fragrance, you buy and large have testers, you know what you're going Absolutely. to happen. You know what you're buying. You buy a book, you buy and have read the back of it, you know by and large this is the content. Now here you're buying a most aspirational fashion product, but what you're buying, you have to visualize how it's going to look without getting, imagine this is a marketing challenge, right? Now how that get completed, earlier there used to be this whole piece that you go into the stores, people would, in the old times, I don't know whether you remember, they'll put a, 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 you know, a piece of fabric on their chest and say, Ki dekho, aisa jacket. That's right, yeah. very, very old times, you know this thing. Then we have had in our stores, if you walk in the stores, they have these very interesting stencils kind of thing. Very interesting innovation they do. That it's almost stencil of a man wearing a jacket, they'll put the fabric behind it, so you actually will see like a, how a jacket will look like. Now we use technology to do something called fabric visualization. I'm just giving one example. We're doing many such things. So now using generative AI, we have tools in our stores where you walk in and all, a large part of our fabrics, and that's a transition we're doing, they have got QR codes. So you walk into the store, you just, the, the store guy will tell you, just scan this QR code and it will pop up a generative AI image where you just press buttons and actually you'll get an AI model image of how a jacket will look like of that fabric. You'll have an AI model image of how, if you want to, some people wear this bandi, how a bandi will look like, or how a shirt will look like. So everything is visualization is done by AI modeling now. now that's a big shift, because without fabric visualization, you can't create a very good sale, you know. So that's moved from manual thing. Now we're on the verge of creating something 
which is the next stage, we're saying, okay, this fabric visualization now happens on a generative AI model. Can we actually make it happen on your face? Because the model, instead of model, it is you. So you see through a generative AI on yourself. We are on the verge of closing that. So in every few months, what will happen is, you'll walk into our stores, you can actually do that whole, through that whole scanning, you can see how that fabric looks on you. So this is a brilliant piece that technology is doing, that we are creating a very brilliant tool of fabric visualization where you see yourself wearing the jacket without actually having been wearing the jacket. So I mean, just one, one example, you know, which comes to Fantastic. Uh, you know, uh, one important piece of marketing has been consumer reach out through, you know, mass media advertising, yeah. right? And advertising has many legs these days. One of the important pieces that has got created in the last few years is storytelling, mm. right? Uh, talk to the consumer, create your own story, create your uh, narrative and kind of, you know, take that narrative uh, through uh, through these years. So I have sort of two uh, double-headed questions around that. For a legacy brand like you, uh, how do you uh, create storytelling which is contemporary, yeah. right? Because, you know, like while uh, the sort of, you know, tagline is very recognizable and emotive, but does it also make the brand feel very old and kind of, you know, if I may say, fuddy duddy? Yeah. So how do you, you know, create that story in the minds of the consumer? And second is for a legacy brand like you and the world, you know, moving so fast in the, you know, digital space. Uh, what are the, what is the role that legacy media still has, you know, to help you, you know, reach out and talk to the same consumers? So I think the first question, let me answer that is a very deep question in the sense from a Raymond point of view. So first of all, Raymond brand has stayed relevant even today. You know? Otherwise, in this year of ours, from a global agency, will not be rated among the top 10 iconic brands in the country. And it's an iconic brand doesn't mean it's, it's, it's based on an indicator called brand strength indicator. So we have the term, top 10 strongest brands in the country. So that tells you the brand is stayed relevant. You know, Obviously, there are some new categories that we have to enter and which we are entering. I can tell you the one, one of the things when I reflect back and maybe there's one presentation I'd done at some of the seminars around a year back where I had traced the journey of Raymond Brand since 1925 and wh what's happened and the, that whole presentation was about how this brand has emotionally engaged with every generation in their own, uh, you know, in their own insights and their own times, you know, connecting with them. And it's a very weird, beautiful plotting you say, what kind of campaigns did Raymond Brand do? for the complete man. And the complete man has stayed through throughout for last almost 40, 50 years. But the, the interpretation of complete man has changed in every generation. And that's about storytelling. So the piece which has happened in Raymond is, first of all, let me tell you one thing, why Raymond is so strong. Pick up any fashion brand in this country or for that which has gone beyond products and engaged with consumers only on emotion. I can't think of any. Because you have to do product advertising in fashion because you are all about products. But everybody stays at products. You know, you will talk about, we make things like, you know, fearless jackets, freedom jackets, uh, techno stretch. We do all that campaigns. But when you do this product advertising, this helps you sell here and now. But the brands doesn't remain in your mind. I tell, I, I was on a road show pre-listing with a lot of these countries. I told everybody who I made outside that you land in India and you just ran in India and just say the complete man. 99% of men will tell you the name of the brand. What, you know, we try to do here. Because there's one thing which has happened in Raymond. That Raymond in every generation or every few years has picked up the insight. And I'll tell you a couple of examples. Which is resonating with the men and the youth of that times and converted that into the relevant, the interpretation of the complete man. So just give you an example. First of all, complete man is not about being perfect. There is a very big... You know, sometimes when I talk to marketers, they're saying, okay, complete man to sikta. And Raymond tries to show everything who's a perfect man. No, Raymond is not trying to show that there's something called perfectness. Raymond's insight is all about that inside us, all of us know that we are imperfect, but we try to be as complete as possible. That, that sounds ourselves. like a narrative created by, you know, wives for yeah. husbands. You, know, yeah. you can't be perfect. So everybody so. knows you can't be perfect, but you at least try to be as complete for yours in, inside you. You'll never know that you'll be 100% there, right? So just to give an example, I mean, you will remember Raymond advertising of that old very teacher ad, you know, right? I don't know whether you remember that, where this teacher is having his farewell, the old man, and the students are giving a very tearful farewell, and the man who taught us all kind of thing. This, I think, was 70s, where the whole thing was about, you know, guru and the teacher thing, that thing was very big in India, you know. Then over the period of time, 
Raymond did a campaign which was uh, again a very iconic campaign where Indians had started traveling abroad after education. So there was this campaign of a young man who's got a job outside. And the parents at that time were always doing everything to send children abroad. And the mother has a very, you know, heartbreaking moment of saying, you know, my son is going abroad. And this guy actually does something. He says, no, I'm going to take you with me. Right? So I don't know about these campaigns. So this is the way in every time when India, and that's the time when Indians were started going abroad for jobs for the first time. I'm talking early 80s, post-liberalization. Last year, we did a campaign which was the first time a new emotion was uh, explored by Raymond, and you may have seen that campaign, which was around bromance. Right? Where this whole campaign happened of a guy. Because, you know, what's happened in the last generations is, one shift in India has happened. That while family relationships are very important, in the social media and the digital media age, friendships have become stronger. Friends have a much larger influence now in the millennials than maybe parents have after a certain age because nuclear families, you are interacting more with friends, you are interacting more in social media. So you tend to interact and get influenced by a lot by peer groups, friends rather than purely taking only advice from parents. Those bonds have not gone away. Right? So we did this whole campaign around, uh, and you can see it on YouTube, this guy's wedding is there and he's standing with his wife and suddenly she says he's sad. The guy is missing his friends. And then these friends make a whole entry and all that and then he just jumps onto and starts dancing with the friends on his own wedding. So this is the emotion of romance. Now what is the completeness about this? That I feel incomplete in my most important moment without friendship. So this is the, Absolutely. It, it's just an evolution I'm just saying. So you pick up some theme which you think is the and that's what I said in that moment. Raymond's, I think, strength has been Raymond has picked up the pulse of the nation and the emotions which are running through at that time. And creates storytelling and around that. Storytelling around. Fantastic. I think that's, I think, the strength of this brand. My second part of the question about, you know, the role you see, of course, everybody talks about digital these days, but the role of legacy media and especially, you know, brands like yours, you know, there's television, print and everything. And India is a yeah. very vast and diverse yeah. country. Uh, all uh, sort of media vehicles are still strong. So wh how do you see that changing over time? No, so this is a balance that is tricky. Wana. So I can tell you even from my ISA part of view. I mean, this is, as I said, when we brand managers, our life was very simple. Thing, Today's brand managers are a bloody tough life out there. You know? This I can tell you. Even. We are lucky to be brand managers in times when you had only TV to take care of it. You press the button, right. do media planning, it was taken care That's of. Right. With so much of fragmentation around so much media, half the things are not measurable, it's a tough battle out there. But yes, to come to the question of this brand which are legacy, uh, which uh, I wouldn't say legacy, which brand which are large and mega. I don't think Raymond is a legacy brand in that sense. Raymond is a, has evolved brand, but yeah, we have a very large multiple parts of our business. There's ethnics by Raymond, there is Raymond right to wear, there is fabric business. One little more legacy, one very modern. Uh, and again, I can tell you, in terms of go-to-market, we are available, we are one of the only brand which is available directly across 660 cities of India. Now that's another challenge. We have, we have 1500 stores of different kinds across 660 cities, very few brands have that. So you are selling in a Mirzapur also, and you're obviously selling in a Mumbai as well. So that's where the that's media cool. challenge comes in. Multiple categories, multiple cohorts, and multiple geographies. So the balancing has to be done in both. So one evolution which has happened for us is, Today, roughly around 35 to 40 percent of our 35 to 40 percent of our spends are on digital. Now, that's as big as I can put a statement out there. You won't have shared with this thing because you know, not very large. There are not many brands who would do that kind of spend. We have to because our products change every three months. Our products, uh, you know, collections change every you know uh, two quarters. We deal with multiple cohorts, so we have to do this micro segmentation of the media. So we spend a lot. We have to do both product stories and we have to do thematic stories. That's a challenge. So hence we do this lot of segmentation of media through focused digital thing. Then at the same time, there is a large thematic piece where you want to keep building the and making sure your brand larger equity remains strong. Where you want to go mass, you want to go a large spray, there we use mass media. So like if a if a TCM campaign, as we call the complete man campaign, were to happen, I would go large mass media. If I have to do focused product campaigns, we use a lot of digital. So I think we try to do a balancing of both. You know. Fantastic. You, uh, apart from being uh, the CEO of Raymond, you also run, you know, you've been the chairman of ISA for, you know, eight years now. Yeah, eight years now yeah. And uh, ISA is the nodal uh, 
uh, body for advertisers, the Indian Society of Advertisers. And I, I must point this out that last eight years of ISA have seen a lot of activity under Sunil, especially on the front where a lot of burning important industry issues have been kind of uh, the talk. Recently, ISA announced the media media charter. Would you like to tell us a little, a little bit more, though a lot of people in the room would have seen the headlines, but what is the motive behind it? How does it help advertisers? Yeah. So ISA obviously is a nodal body and ISA is also one of the founding members of World Federation of Advertisers, which is one of the largest global bodies of advertisers, which is a chapter in every country, and a very, very active body of WFA, uh, which is there. So we work very collaboratively with World Federation of which is at the cutting edge of all global practi best practices. And we have created something called a media charter for India. It has five parts to it, which have been rolled out right now. The first which we rolled out last year was a model media agency agreement, right? So which is about, you know, see, in advertisers, when you talk advertisers, what happens is there are obviously the large big brand advertisers, which we see around very easily. They have very large media teams, which can deal, negotiate across with agencies very directly. But one of the role of ISA is also to take care of the smaller advertisers, educate them help them get the best out of the ecosystem in a very fair manner and transparent manner. So what we rolled out first was a media model media agency agreement, how it looked like. Now the, around 45 days back, what we have rolled out is four very critical playbooks, which are cutting edge playbooks for India. And uh, you can reach out to the ISA office and ask them to share it with you, which is because the way the digital has changed in India globally, and then in India the last decade, uh, there are new terminologies on how to run your brand which have come into place. So the four big themes which have got advertised, uh, identified, which is brand safety in a digital world. Very important things. Today, the, as you go digital, the control of your brand becomes weaker in your hand. Unlike a TV where you could control everything. You know where the spot can come. You, can, you know your creative is under control. Everything is under your control. Now with digital uh, programmatic uh, you know, placements, it's, it's exactly not in your control. You know. It's dynamic, everything. So brand safety. Then there are very big, with technology comes both advantage, both come challenges. With we are seeing more and more across the world, ad frauds on the increase. So ad fraud is another thing which is very big. Third is, what is viewability? There are multiple definitions of viewability in digital world, right? And then the fourth is, one thing which is becoming more and more new skill is how to manage first party data. And this I can tell you from now live experience, in FMCG you don't control too much of first party data. But in company like Raymond Lifestyle, you know, I have got CRM data off through my stores Each of, customer you know, one, more than one crore customers, you know. And it's one of the most powerful first party data that we have, which we use, while I could not give that example, which we use in a very, very dynamic manner digitally. In fact, Raymond runs one of the most, you know, digitally advanced CRM programs within your thinking. And that can be a separate topic of discussion. Now, these are the five playbooks that we have created based on global best practices, but suited to India, which is about what is brand safety, how to take care of that, ad frauds, what is it, what are tools there to take care of ad, ad fraud, how do you define measure of, uh, viewability, then how do you use first party data. And these are four playbooks which have got rolled out as part of this media charter. Uh, I'm more than happy. Obviously, the big thing is we have rolled it out. More and more advertisers need to get educated about it. All data tells us that even the most advanced marketing organization in this country, if you were to go and survey among 10 people, they will not have the same definition of viewability in their minds. That's a challenge. And that's what this media charter is. Yeah, I think it's been a very challenging aspect, especially the uh, rise of digital platform has been so fast and rapid that, uh, you know, I mean, the industry is pretty much surviving on their own definitions, right? Today, you know, what counts as viewability on Instagram versus YouTube versus Facebook versus so many platforms yeah. is dependent upon, you know, them telling you what is happening. As a marketer, how do you see it? And in many ways, it's very interesting you talk about these four playbooks. Of course, there is a common narrative across these uh, four playbooks and they are kind of interrelated. Uh, as a marketer, how do you see this challenge? Uh, uh, you know, on one side, brand safety is extremely important for yeah. each marketer. Uh, you're also bothered about, you know, there are lots of estimates, but some of them say maybe 40, 50 percent of the money you are spending on, you know, digital advertising either is not properly targeted or uh, are going as complete waste, right? So that's a very big uh, issue for marketers. And then comes the, you know, point about uh, viewability. I remember when you know, these ratings agencies and television were launched. There was so much hair splitting that was done.
to you know whether you should count one minute as viewership yeah. or you know how it should be done whereas digital is a complete black box so as a marketer how do you sort of deal with these challenges uh, so I, i'll tell you there's no easy answer to this if you ask you're looking that for me you know one thing even when we had this tv at this thing i mean there's this fam famous quote you know by david galvi that i know half of my marketing the advertising money doesn't work it's just that i don't know which one doesn't work and, and, and just the platforms <laughs> have changed right so, from so you know so that's the fact that was even when we had a very half of my digital advertising that money yeah. doesn't work so you know i guess that says true itself that half of it still doesn't work the only thing we don't know which one doesn't work so i think the no the fact is just the digital landscape is very very dynamic if you're looking for answer from me saying ki okay how do you make the most sense of it i think one challenge obviously we have in the country is that right now we don't have a single digital currency of measurement that's a piece of evolution that will take its own time because there are multiple stakeholders involved and that will that evolution happens over a period of time and i i'm sure at that some stage will all come to a common ground where we'll say okay this is one common way of measuring digital but i can tell you even after that emerges there is always this gray part which is going to remain because digital evolves at a crazy dynamic pace you know we have i mean we have uh, for example who thought that you know insta will emerge as a platform of a very different kind four Just years back two years yeah two yeah, three years three years back yeah. there was nothing called uh, insta you know there was nothing called a reel you know right where everybody was only thinking it's only facebook right and suddenly this happened and then insta happens now we talk of there's a generational split there that the gen z is only on insta and the millennials older millennials only on facebook i mean so you know you have to keep doing this so i think the name of the game is yes this technology will keep evolving i think you have to keep abreast yourself at the speed maybe of 100 times what you are doing earlier to be aware of the technology that is sure. one piece second thing which i have learned right and although i'm not a practicing marketer anymore i mean i'm i supervise a company and have this thing i can tell you if a brand managers and marketers 20 years back needed to learn certain things over a period of year i think now you have to learn it over a period of a month or secondly earlier you had agencies where you had learned the principle of media planning once broadly then you can outsource it to a media agency saying ki but yeah i know all the media planning principles mujhe media buying samajh aa gaya now i just i'm outsourcing it to you i'll review uh, uh, something called a pva or you know plan versus actual i will review cprps i have a dashboard which i can control this thing i can tell you with this such evolution happening of multiple tools across with very difficult measurement thing you have to actually practice doing it yourself because there's no way you can outsource and saying ki okay i give it to you now you tell me the measurement so you will have to you have to do a little bit more of do it yourself now as a marketer before you can actually understand it fantastic yeah it's a far more complex world for marketers as opposed to an era when all you had to do was place slots on mahabharat yeah. and your product would sell thank Aren't you even... sunil i mean i can go on this conversation yeah. can be 3 hours but i've been given more than one stare from the side uh, thank you uh, for this uh, interesting uh, insightful discussions those uh, for those of you uh, who are around uh, please stay back for the pitch top 50 brand awards which follows right after and i hope uh, you'll 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 all enjoy your evening thank you so much thank you so much